I work from home and Ashley does too. So the place where I used to edit my videos is where she works now. And a little over a year ago, I built an editing booth when I thought Ashley would return to the office, but that doesn't look like that's gonna happen anytime soon. So in my last video, I tore out the booth, which is way too small for me and converted it into a storage room. So now I have plenty of space to build my dream office. There is a lot to do in this build, including electrical, drywall, painting, wallpapering, and wood siding. So let's get started. see this. This this outlet was just behind the drywall. That one I knew was there, this one I didn't. That's crazy. I wish I could say that this is the strangest thing that I found in this building, but it's not. Not only was the outlet in there, it was also fully hooked up and wired backwards. So it's always good to check your outlets if you buy a new house. I'm gonna be putting in a whole bunch of new outlets into this room, but this circuit also connects into my garage. So as I remove outlets, I need to make sure that this circuit runs all the way through into those existing outlets on the other side of the wall. It took a little bit to puzzle out and I am not a professional electrician, but I feel confident enough to do a couple of outlets here and there. I did have an electrician friend come by after I'd done all the work and inspect it and make sure that it was all okay. Fortunately, this room had drywall in it, but the drywall was only secured with screws. So it was easy to take those panels off, which made it way easier to do the electrical work. It's super nice to be able to lay out your own outlets. I did this in my workshop and uh, it's been really, really nice to do. It's one of the first things that I start with is figuring out where I want all of my plugged in devices and, uh, and then set up the layout for electrical because if you don't do it at this stage, it's really hard to do later. The left wall was pretty straightforward. I was able to get three new outlets in and connect back into the original power. The right wall, however, was a little more complicated. So this outlet connects directly into the panel. And so there is no place to kind of end this circuit. So what I decided to do was to cut the power, run the cord up into the ceiling, and there's a little crawl space up there that I was able to install a junction box. Okay, J box is installed. You're gonna have to take my word for it because it's really tight quarters in there. From the junction box, I dropped a new piece of Romex down into the wall, and then I could start connecting up the new outlets. Oh, and if you're wondering what all that pink and orange stuff is inside of the wall, that's all Bondo. This building was used by an auto body worker before I moved in, and I find Bondo everywhere. I was on the fence about reusing the old drywall because it was in kind of rough shape, but for what I'm using these walls for, they don't need to be perfect. And I decided rather than throw them in the dump, just use what I have. They're also already cut to fit. Beautiful. So here's a quick tip for cutting your holes in drywall. I like to just draw on my tape measure and my T-square with a pencil and then transfer those lines onto the drywall panel. I find this is a really fast way to do it and I get really good results. To cut the hole, I use a drywall jab saw. These work great and they cost about 10 bucks at your local hardware store. Huh, oof, it's gross back there. Oh, that's a good one, this way. 
this drywall panel was pretty far gone on the bottom like third of it so i decided to cut that end off i did ultimately have to buy a new sheet of drywall but only one sheet to do this entire room which i'd say is pretty darn good I also should mention that I left about a half inch space underneath the panels as I was screwing them in, and this should help prevent getting any moisture damage from the concrete below it. Next up was to tape and mud off the drywall. Now, I said this in my last video that I am not great at mudding, and I got a lot of uh, a lot of suggestions for stuff to do, but I was already working on this uh, project by the time you guys sent in those suggestions. So they are appreciated. If you don't see them used on this project, that's because I didn't get them in time. Uh, a lot of people said to add a lot more water to the mud than I'm using, uh, so I will take that into my next project. A lot of people said not to wet the tape, and uh, I've always done that. I've gotten that suggestion. It's always worked for me. I haven't had issues with it bubbling, but some people said that wetting the tape is a bad thing. My guess is that there's a lot of different ways to, to mud drywall and a lot of different opinions out there, which I do appreciate. Uh, I just... Uh... <laughs> I don't ex expect to become a professional mutter anytime soon. I have a lot of respect for the people who can do that well. Ultimately, in this room, all these walls are going to get covered uh, with something. It's either going to be wallpaper, which does need to be flat, but the siding is going to cover a lot of this. And then I'm also going to put sound panels up. So you're really not going to see a lot of this wall. This is a quick drywall patching tip. I like these better than the mesh versions that you buy at the big box store. You can make it out of a scrap piece of drywall. You just cut it a little bit bigger and then score it to the size of the hole that you need and then break off the excess, leaving the paper there so that you can just mud over the top of that. It works really well and it doesn't cost you anything. After three coats of mud and some sanding and some sanding and some more sanding, <laughs> I was ready to paint. These walls were painted before, but you always want to go over the top of fresh mud and fresh drywall with primer. If you don't use primer, you'll see those tape strips through multiple layers of paint, and it's just a better sealer than, than regular paint. Speaking of paint, I'm going to be painting the upper third of this room, and in order to do that, I'm just quickly using my laser level to give me a mark that I can see through the paint while I roll it out. I'm using the same black paint that I used on my tool wall, which I love my tool wall, but as I was rolling this out in this little room, something just didn't feel right. I think I made a mistake. <laughs> that's, too, that's too black. Uh, I thought it looked cool. It doesn't. It's too dark. Uh, I'm gonna change it up. I'm gonna get a different paint. Probably Go back to the ceiling being white and the wall being like a, like a dark gray or something. Looks so much better. I was really happy with the changes that I made and now I was ready to start wallpapering. This is my first time with wallpaper and I was incredibly intimidated, but it turned out it was not as hard as I imagined it might be. So I pictured in my head the old school style of doing it where you wet the back of the paper, the paste is already embedded in the paper, but modern wallpapers apparently have switched to adding the paste to the wall and then applying the wallpaper to the wall, which is way easier. First, you lay out a liberal amount of paste with a paint roller. It doesn't have to be perfect, and the main thing is just to have plenty of it because that allows the, the paper to move around. This stuff is water-based, so it lifts up easily with a sponge, so if you make any mistakes, it's really not that bad. So I laid out a level line and I followed that level line on the right hand side and then I could squeegee out all of the excess paste and air bubbles that might be in there. 
Now this was my first attempt and it didn't go great. So I was able to just peel that piece off, add more paste and reapply it. It's, it's really that simple, which was a surprise to me. It takes a long time for the paste to dry, probably, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. So you've got time to work with it. And the main thing is just spending the time to get those air bubbles out. After the air bubbles are out, you can go over the top of it with a sponge, wipe down any excess. And from there, it's just rinse and repeat. The only difference with the next panels is instead of following the level line, I'm just following the line of the panel next to it. And that's the most important bit. It'll, it'll stay level as long as you keep it butted up against that line. I found this process incredibly relaxing to the point that I completely lost track of time. I, I, I thought this was taking me like two hours. I think this wall took me about four hours and it was easily like 7.30 or eight by the time I finished doing the first wall. But it was really fun. I, I recommend trying out wallpaper if you've never done it before. To determine where I cut the pattern, I just followed the instructions on the package. They have a repeat pattern length, and I went for two of those lengths, which was roughly 45 inches. I cut each one one at a time, which probably isn't the most efficient way to do it, but I was worried that if it got off at all, that I, I would uh, cut a whole bunch of them and then find that they were messed up. And it, that didn't end up being a problem. Actually, it, it ended up lining up really well. The only thing that I found was that when I changed from my first roll of wallpaper to the second roll, there was a little misalignment from where they cut it at the factory. So keep that in mind. If you change rolls, you should make sure and line up your pattern. It wasn't very far off for me and uh, it didn't end up changing anything in the end. One thing I discovered while I was doing this is that bubbles just keep forming and it's worth going over it multiple times just to double check that there's not a fresh bubble that's formed on one of the sheets. Because once it's dry, you can't get it out. After putting in that nice wallpaper, I thought it would be great to rip up the floor. This was so covered in, in drywall and other paint um, that I thought this would be a good idea. Uh, it turned out that it, it came back to bite me in the end. Uh, it wasn't too hard to get the, the top surface off, but later on I realized I have to deal with the bottom surface. We'll get to that in a minute. Meanwhile, I took a trip to Second Use. They are not a sponsor, but I do love a good architectural salvage place. I found this Douglas fir, VG fir online, and, uh, and I went to grab it. They had plenty to cover the walls with. And it was a lot cheaper than if I bought it from a lumber yard. This is tongue and groove, which I'm going to be using when I do the paneling. But right now I just want to trim out the door. And for that, I'm going to cut off both the tongue and the groove side. So it'll match the rest of the room. I'm planning on keeping this bifold door, but there, there really wasn't any casing for it. So uh, I kind of had to improvise. I just nailed on a couple strips and kept testing the door to make sure that it could open and close. Once I had a finished edge to nail to, I could then add in the trim. Remember when I mentioned the issue with the flooring i was hoping just to leave it at this stage but i'm planning on putting in carpet tiles and the carpet tiles need to stick to something so i had this idea to use some carpet tape try and stick it down and it wouldn't stick to it so the next step was to try and scrape it scraping didn't work and i read online that you can wet the adhesive and scrape it up from there while this worked it was an entire day of work just to scrape this floor down. It was a huge pain. By the end of it, I had figured out quite a few good ways to do it. Uh, one of the things is to make sure and sharpen your tools as you go. I found that they got dull really quick and just adding a file, you were able to scrape up things a lot faster. 
The other thing that I found is that just a basic putty knife sharpened with uh, some sandpaper was able to really clear out area fast. This actually might have been the fastest technique, but it was also kind of the most backbreaking because I had to be down on my knees and uh, and push through it. Whew, this sucks. But after several hours, I was able to get the floor cleaned up. Oh. miserable with the floor clean I could start in on the wood paneling and for this I'm gonna install a couple of MDF ledgers the concrete floor isn't level so the ledgers are gonna give me a level line to start from I'm going a little bit taller than the first course so I'll start on the second course when when I get in there uh, this will allow me to put the baseboards in later and just kind of slip them up into place and even if there's a gap at the bottom of the floor that's not gonna matter because when I put the carpet tiles in it'll cover up that gap to nail these on, I just nail into the tongues and you'll notice on the wall, I have the studs marked. So as I go up, it's really easy to just spot it and, and nail it. And then you don't see any visible nails from the outside. I decided to start with the back wall because it's one of the most complicated walls with this little port that's in there. Uh, this is for the Glowforge. I need an exhaust port for the Glowforge and uh, it was simple enough to glue up an extra panel at this stage and nail it in. I've got the hole drilled out and then I can easily drill the hole through the drywall when I need to. The opposite side was a rinse and repeat, just minus the exhaust port. There's a fair amount of processing to do to the boards before I install them on the walls. I square up the ends, cut them to length, and then sand the faces of all the boards. These were pretty dirty, they had stickers on them, and they took a fair bit of sanding, but I think it's worth it so that I don't have to sand them while they're up on the wall. For the boards that were going vertical, I cut a groove at the bottom using my tenoning jig. I've got plans for this tenoning jig up on my website if you're interested in picking them up. Uh, it's a pretty simple little jig that will work universally with a bunch of different table saws. With the addition of the groove cut at the bottom, these vertical slats went in really quick. I also put in a couple of pieces of blocking behind them so that I could nail them onto something. Fortunately, I had access to the inside of that wall, so I just put in a couple of two by fours. To slot in the last one, I added a short piece that I just ripped on the table saw, and then I could use a putty knife and a pry bar to pry them into place so that they're sitting in that tongue. It's a little bit of a gap on that side so that there's room for expansion and contraction. To cap off the vertical slats, I just flipped one of the tongue and groove pieces upside down so that the tongue was facing down and then that slotted into the grooves and locked everything into place. After that, it was back to milling, which these are all the boards that are gonna go against the walls. These aren't cut to a specific length. I'm just trimming off the bad sections. I'm basically processing the lumber. If there's any flaws or anything, I'm cutting those out. Since I'm gonna to have to cut a lot of these down to length, it made a lot of sense to me to have my chop saw in the space with me. I find with jobs like this where there's a lot of repetitive cuts, it's good to get your tools as close as possible to you so you minimize the amount of walking back and forth. For most of the boards, I'm only using nails, but a couple of the boards were shorter than 16 inches, which means that they're only going to connect to one stud in the wall. So I added construction adhesive to those. As I worked my way across the wall, I'd occasionally hit outlets and to cut out the, the hole for the outlet, this is pretty easy. I just lay the panel into place, make the marks that I need, and then take it over to the bandsaw to cut it out.
With the left wall done, I could switch my tools around and start in on the right wall. This started going really fast, especially having the chop saw in, in the room. And this was the easier wall because all the outlets were at the top. I found some of the cuts really hard to make on the bandsaw. So I actually ended up using a combination of a, of a Japanese pull saw. And I also used the multi-tool, which uh, turned out to be really good for these small trim bits. The last strip that I added had the tongue removed from the top and it was sanded down. I also uh, should have pre-finished this because it's right up against the wallpaper. I'm gonna be pre-finishing some of these panels, um, but I, I wish I had the foresight to do it on all the ones that touch the wallpaper. To attach the upper trim, I used the laser level again, and these pieces have both the tongue and the groove removed from them, so they're a little bit thinner, but I'm, I don't think you can really tell. It was at this point that I could remove those ledgers that I installed before. They come off pretty easily with a pry bar. And as you can see, I made it tall enough so I can just slip these underneath. Again, I use a pry bar to lift it into the tongue and then I can nail it off. Next, I could focus on the wall with the glass door. I added in a bit of molding around the door and then I could slip in some strips to the wall. I did decide to glue these in. I think that I was able to capture a couple of two by fours, but I didn't know how much structure was in this wall. So I just decided to add construction adhesive as an insurance policy. The vertical ones definitely didn't have any support, so I just glued those on and they should be fine. As I thought more about what I'd have to do to apply finish to these walls, I decided to pre-finish these uprights. It's gonna make my life a lot easier. I wish I had thought of it sooner, um, but I'm gonna go through and do a tips and tricks video on water-based finishes. That's what I'm using here. I'm using Total Boat Halcyon Clear, and I'll do a whole video on water-based finishes because they really are some of my favorite finishes. There's loads of advantages to using them. I think they look great and they're easy to apply. I'll go into that in a later video, uh, but for, for now, I pre-finished these so that I can make my life easier when I go through the full finishing process next week. I really love installing trim. Uh, I feel like it's a great kind of puzzle to figure out how to get all these finished edges on everything, make sure everything looks right, make sure that there's no kind of weird dead ends and stuff. And ultimately, I honestly like this wall with the glass door a little better than the wall with the wood door. I actually went back and swapped out one of the pieces of trim because I thought I could match that side a little better, make it a little tighter, a little bit neater and I'm glad that I did.
How much better is this room? It's so nice in here. I just can't wait to get to work and uh, set up my desk in here. There's still a lot left to do. I still have to put finish on the walls and put in the, the outlets and I've got to fix the lighting. The acoustics are terrible. I wanna build a sit stand desk. I've, I've gotta build cabinets and lots and lots of things to do. But this is about 10 days in and I'm still super excited about it. So let me know in the comments down below if there's any sort of office-y things that I should know about, modern office accessories and stuff because I'd like to do that as well when I build the desk have a bunch of cool accessories and stuff. So thanks for watching the video. Thank you to Deal Dash for sponsoring this video. And thank you as always to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I'll catch you on the next one.